So we're uh, continuing on from uh, from last um, uh, last class, uh, talking about electromagnetics in the modern world. Uh, so what we're let me just skip ahead these slides here. So we were just talking about um, a lot of the different uh, application areas where electromagnetics plays a role. And the reason, as I mentioned, I like to do this is to give a sense for um, the importance of electromagnetics in your electrical engineering careers. In fact, I'll have a slide on that at the end, which talks about how electromagnetics fits into the different areas that electrical engineers would work on. And these are some of the examples of just some applications that um, uh, typical electrical engineers would uh, use that, that electromagnetics plays a significant role in. So last time we talked about, just to skim real quick, we talked about electromagnetic waves and we talked about the electromagnetic spectrum, how there's uh, you know a, a very large um, portions of the spectrum that we use for uh, a variety of things like radio communications. We talked about, um, uh, you know, like AM and FM radio, mobile phones and radar. Then we talked about the visible portion of the spectrum or the light that we typically uh, that we typically talk about as light. So there's the infrared and ultraviolet and the terahertz portion of the spectrum. The visible portion is just 700 to 440 nanometers, just a small portion of the spectrum really. And those that's the small region of the electromagnetic spectrum that our eyes can actually see. We talked about the X-rays and gamma rays, higher energy radiation uh, tends to be more dangerous, but there's a lot of other things you can do with it. Like uh, for example, these higher energy rays tend to penetrate through objects um, and it's used for medical imaging and baggage screening and so forth. Uh, gamma rays we talked a little bit about, but uh, we then uh, moved on to wireless communication. We talked about the role of electromagnetics and antenna design. We, we briefly mentioned about some of the issues that the early Apple iPhones had when they switched to antennas um, just on the outside of the iPhones that highlights some of the importance, the importance of proper antenna design. I think some of you saw the, um, the wireless sensor that I'm working on in my lab where you now you can see that the Bluetooth antennas are really, really tiny now, and that allows us to have wireless in everything, which is quite amazing. Uh, so we showed some examples of the miniaturization of antennas that's happened over the last uh, 10, 10 or 15 years. We talked a little bit about RFID, about how electromagnetics plays a very important role in these simple uh, passive devices that can be used for, uh, for tagging objects, it's used in like races uh, for measuring, you know, how fast someone uh, completes the race or, or goes over the finish line. It's used in highways for toll type applications. And these are all wireless devices, just senses when an RFID tag is near there. And then um, uh, the RFID tag sends a reflected electromagnetic signal, which, uh, which can be used to identify that particular object, whether it's a car passing a toll booth or a runner going over a finish line and so on. Uh, RFID is also used in uh, automobile ignitions nowadays. We talked about electromagnetics in remote sensing. So this is where we look at the parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that is either emitted or reflected by uh, a planetary body. Uh, one of the big things from last year is that we, um, by looking at X-ray um, and other types of light emitted or not emitted by uh, a black hole, last year was a big breakthrough that uh, was the first um, uh, telescope that was able to actually image a black hole. And it actually wasn't a single telescope, it was actually a bunch of telescopes that were all over the world and, and together they can make a higher resolution image. I'm not going to go into all the details of that, but uh, electromagnetics and electromagnetic wave modeling played a very important role in the first image of the black hole. Now, other examples you can see of like things like uh, Jupiter, Saturn, like these types of, um, uh, of images of the Sun they're all done by just looking at the object in different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, you know, a a satellites use uh, remote sensing to look at uh, uh, things like climate change on Earth. They're used for when they're orbiting other planetary bodies as well. Um, have any, has anyone heard of the Parker Solar Probe? It's one of the most uh, it's one of the most recent satellites that NASA developed and sent off towards the sun and it's doing some amazing uh, science of the solar flares and all sorts of physics of the sun that's happening right now. Um, and it's, it, it's a specially made satellite that has a heat shield that, that can tolerate really, really high temperatures. So they have it, they have it orbiting the sun right now. Very exciting. Uh, we talked a little bit about medical imaging. Um, the role of electromagnetics in medical imaging is basically that electromagnetic waves can penetrate through the body. Different parts of the body, whether you have tissue or bone, 
Uh, they respond to these electromagnetic waves in a different manner. This allows you to generate images uh, with contrast of these different elements in the human body. Um, uh, MRI is a very big one that allows you to generate three-dimensional images of tissue, and, uh, and, and it's quite amazing how MRIs really uh, change the game in medicine. And we talked a little bit about linear accelerators where electromagnetics is used to accelerate particles at a very, very high speed, and these are used for cancer radiation therapy where we need high energy radiation. It's also used in uh, high energy particle physics research at places like CERN in Switzerland, where um, la uh, two years ago they discovered the Higgs boson uh, using these high energy experiments. Uh, we started, we ended off the class talking about electrostatic sensors, um, and this is kind of going at the small scale now. A lot of the examples I showed you before were at the larger scale. Um, one of the things about uh, electrostatic fields, and we're going to be talking a lot about electrostatics, is that they, um, they are quite functional and quite usable uh, at the small scale, at microscopic length scales. And so um, our ability to make sensors very, very tiny, our, our ability to make objects very, very tiny using micro and nanofabrication techniques has allowed us to exploit electrostatic fields in a way that we were never able to, say, a couple decades ago. Because when you make really small devices, you can actually move them with electrostatic fields. We can't move large objects with electrostatic fields. So um, these really, really tiny um, objects uh, can be used for detecting acceleration. Um, I'll show you an example of one. I went over this last time also, but I think it's worth it to just show some of the details. I don't know if I had a chance to, but um, this is an example of a capacitive accelerometer. The way it works is that you have two electrodes, okay? Uh, what, what's a capacitor? Let's ask everyone. What, what is a capacitor? Two plates separated by, two plates yeah. separated by uh, it could be air, it could be some other dielectric material. But in this case, it's separated by air. You have two metal plates separated by air. What happens if the distance between the plates changes? What happens to the capacitance? Let's say the distance between the plate decreases. The capacitance increases, right? Um, so capacitance is equal to epsilon A over D. So if you have two plates like this, two metal plates separated by some distance D, you have a parallel plate capacitor. Okay, and so if that D changes, the, that D decreases, capacitance increases. Okay, and electronically we can measure changes in capacitance by using capacitance meters. Um, and analog devices actually has a fancy form of a uh, you know, fancier forms of capacitance meters that can detect really, really tiny changes in capacitance. All right, so this is pretty interesting. So now um, uh, what happens is that one of the electrodes is on the bottom. That's the, the flat thing that you see on the surface here. The other electrode is a piece of metal that's, that looks more like a block than a sheet. So this big heavy thing up here. And that big heavy thing is hanging on like on a beam. <laughs> So when you, when you move this device, what happens is that this uh, large block, which is called a proof mass, it moves, it starts to move uh, in the presence of acceleration. Okay, and the, the, the amount that it moves is proportional to the amount of acceleration applied to it. So basically what will happen is you, if, you, if you move this whole device up, you know, in the upward direction very suddenly, then this uh, proof mass is going to uh, um, move closer to the, uh, to the surface and the D is going to decrease and the capacitance will increase and we can measure that increase. And you might be asking, well, why are there so many of these little proof masses? Well, the more of these proof masses we have, it increases the effective area and increasing the effective area makes it more sensitive, it makes it a more sensitive device. So the cool thing about this is you can kind of see here that the, the size scale here is 10 microns. This bar here is 10 microns. 10 microns is about 1 100th the diameter of your hair. Take a hair, it's about 100 microns in diameter. This is a tenth of that. So we can make these sensors very, very tiny, whereas before, um, you know, capacitive accelerometers or other types of accelerometers that have been used typically were made much larger. They were more expensive. Making these things tiny and dirt cheap, like you can buy an accelerometer now for like less than a dollar, 
Now it's cheap enough to put in all sorts of devices. So I mentioned that accelerometers goes into your phone. When you rotate your phone, it, um, it changes the screen orientation. Uh, for those of you who use things like Apple Health Kit or Google Fit, um, your phone is actually tracking your motion. So you're, when you're walking from class to class during the day, it's actually counting the number of steps because the accelerometer is measuring the, uh, the acceleration while the phone is in your pocket. Those of you who own Fitbits and devices like this, you know, as you're swinging your arms when you're walking, it's counting the number of steps that way. All right, these accelerometers are in all sorts of devices nowadays. It's also in the Nintendo Wii for, for gaming type applications. One of my favorite games used to be that tennis, you know, a tennis game on Wii. That thing was, was pretty neat. And then um, at airbag deployment, that was the first huge success for um, accelerometers. As many of you know, since we're in the Motor City, many of you work in the automotive area, you know that uh, automotive is an extremely competitive industry and um, they nickel and dime everything, right? Every sensor has to be dirt cheap, absolutely cheap. So um, before cars, the high-end cars used to have one airbag, two airbags, most cars didn't have any airbags. And nowadays after the accelerometers came into place, um, the sensor is so cheap now that you can put them, you can put multiple uh, accelerometers, you can have multiple redundancies, and this has basically allowed us to have uh, many, um, uh, have airbag deployment, not only airbag deployment, but also things like electronic stability control, which senses when the car is skidding and it adjusts the power to the wheels. Um, and I mentioned even there's things like progressive insurance companies are putting, telling, we'll send you this pod and we'll, you can put it in your car. What it is, and it's, an, it's an accelerometer that's measuring how, how rapidly you brake and accelerate. So this is some electrostatic sensors. They work on the principle of um, uh, this, uh, capacitance and motion. Uh, electrostatic actuators, I talked about it uh, last time I showed you the video, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail on it now, but uh, the main point I wanna make here is that this was a device <coughs> that's like a seesaw. It's a seesaw with a, um, let's go back to this one. It's a seesaw device with a fulcrum in the middle and you have an electrode on top and then two electrodes on the bottom. If you apply a voltage between these two electrodes, then the micromirror will rotate in one direction. If you apply a voltage between these two electrodes, the, the micromirror will rotate in the other direction. And these the rotations are due to electrostatic force. Um, you charge up the plate, you get positive charge on one end, negative charge on the other end, very similar to a capacitor, except at the micro scale, this force is large enough to actually cause a, a force that, that causes the, the uh, object to move. All right. Whereas at the larger scale, yeah, you get the, you get the charges, but you don't, the, the thing, there's not enough force to make the thing actually move. Looks like someone's moving chairs next next door. All right. So um, the application of digital micromirror devices in your movie theaters, high-end movie theaters, you have like each one of these chips has a million mirrors in it, million tiny mirrors, and these mirrors like rotate, and that creates the um, it reflects light onto the screen, and that's how you get your um, DLP movies. All right, so now I'm going to go into some of the stuff we didn't cover. Um, this is stuff that's not out in the consumer world yet, but um, it's, uh, it's used widely in the biotech field. Uh, electric fields are used in what's called lab on a chip systems. This is one of the areas in, of research that I work in. Um, the field of lab on a chip uh, attempts to take a lot of the diagnostics that you would, you would do in a large biological laboratory where instruments take up the entire room. Uh, while well, instruments take up a large benchtop space or even an entire room, and to try to shrink a lot of those detectors and sensors and instrumentation down to really, really tiny chips that can be used at home. It could be used portably out in the field for like military or field ops. Um, it could be used uh, in a home for like home health monitoring type applications. It can be used for like, you know, mobile health clinics and things like that. And eventually there's interest in having like wearable, uh, wearable devices as well that do analysis while it's on your body. Um, so uh, this is obviously a very big field, but I just wanted to touch on one interesting thing with electrostatics um, in lab on a chip systems. So uh, yeah, you can use um, this, this effect called dielectrophoresis, which is a non-uniform electric field. We're going to be talking about uh, uniform electric fields and non-uniform electric fields in this class. Um, and 
you know, you can see an example of how a particle responds to um, di the different types of field. Um, if you have a, a, a uh, what's called a polarizable particle, but and it's not, it has no effective charge, um, then there will be no net force on that body. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this in, in just this next module, but just very, very briefly, um, if, a, if you put a particle in an electric field and that particle happens to be charged, that electric field is going to exert a force on the charge. So you can actually move particles with electrostatic fields. That's what's happening in this case. In this case, the particle actually didn't have any net charge. Okay, there's no net charge, meaning um, no net charge means it could have positive charge and negative charge both. If they're equal to each other, then there's no net charge. All right, whereas this one just has negative charge in it. This one has equal amounts of positive and negative charge. So there's no net charge. And if you have a uniform electric field, you can't move a particle that has no net charge. So, but if you use a non-uniform field, so a non-uniform field would be, instead of having two parallel plate electrodes generating the field, you have a dot, one of the electrodes is a circle and the other one is a ring around it. You get a, um, a much higher electric field intensity density in the middle. And so this non-uniform field turns out it can move, um, it can move particles that don't have any charge on them by, by this polarizability effect. Again, I'm not going to go into all the details of it, but um, you know, it's, the main thing is just to give you give you a sense for what these things can do. Um, I'm going to show a, a YouTube video here. All right, what you're looking at here, what you're looking at here are um, small particles. Okay. These particles are 25 microns in diameter or so, which is about one quarter the diameter of your hair. And this is before the field is applied and after. You'll see right when the field is applied, boom, the particles line up to the electrodes. So this is using uh, dielectrophoresis effects to concentrate and collect particles using electric fields. So where might something like this be useful? One of the most exciting things was um, back in the early 2000s, um, uh, Peter Gascoigne, a researcher from uh, the, the MD Anderson Center in Houston, showed that cancer cells have a certain dielectric signature and they could be, dielectrophoresis could be used to isolate cancer cells from blood while leaving the other cells unaffected. So in this case, the cell is the particle. So here, in this video, you're seeing like little like polystyrene beads, but you can do the same thing with cells and you can pull certain cells out of, um, out of blood and, um, by using uh, this dielectrophoresis effect. What you saw there is it said one megahertz up there because these, um, these fields are actually frequency dependent. So certain frequencies will, will act on particles of a certain size and certain frequencies will act on the particles of a different size. So there's a lot of interesting science uh, behind this. So um, uh, dielectrophoretic forces are used to collect and uh, manipulate uh, cells and particles and other objects. These are some examples of microfabricated electrodes that can generate very interesting um, uh, fields that can be used to trap uh, particles and so forth. Um, let's see what this other video was. Oh yeah, this is a video that I was going to show next anyways. Um, I think there's a larger version of it in the slides, so let me see if that one will work. There we go. So this is really cool. Um, this is an example of where electric fields are used for uh, something called cell sorting. All right, we have, you know, as you know, we have like millions, billions of cells, several billion cells in just um, a, a one milliliter sample of blood. Okay, there's a lot of applications where the, the clinicians or researchers are interested in sorting cells by their type. For example, uh, a, a simple application would be, let's say you have red blood in your blood, in a typical blood, you have like red blood cells, you have white blood cells, you have uh, platelets, you have like um, uh, other types of objects in your blood. So uh, there's an interest in, let's say we want to isolate just the red blood cells or isolate just the white blood cells. One of the things you can do is you can, um, you can have a sensor, 
you can have a sensor that detects the size of the object. It's typically done by using a laser. In this video, we will teach you how to correctly port, assemble, and desiccate your microfluidic tube. Where is that coming from? Oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So, uh, um, what you could imagine, if you want to do cell sorting, what you do is you can put the cells, or in this case they're little droplets, but you can do this on cells as well. You pack the cells into a channel here and then, um, then you flow the cells single file through a really, really tiny channel. So these channels are like 20 to 100 microns wide. So now the cells are flowing single file. Um, what you see here, this black thing that you see here, are two electrodes. And you pulse a voltage between those two electrodes. When you pulse that voltage, it creates a non-uniform electric field in the region where this pointer really is. And that non-uniform field can direct a cell in this direction, in the lower direction, or the upper direction. So it's basically sending off a cell into one of the two outlets. Um, in this case, in this example, what they were doing is they weren't sorting cells, they were sorting droplets. And you can see that the, all the dark droplets go into this channel and all the um, light droplets go into this lower channel. Um, these little flashes of light that you see here is like a laser, um, is a laser system that detects the color of the droplets. And immediately when the laser detects the color, within, within a half a millisecond, uh, it sends a signal to these uh, electrodes and those electrodes create a force and that force will push uh, the electrodes into one channel or pull it into the other um, into the other channel. And this is a dielectrophoretic force that acts on the droplets or the cells. It works by that virtue of dielectrophoresis that I showed you on the previous slide. So electrical fields can actually do a lot of really cool stuff at the, um, at the microscale because these electric fields can be generated very, very quickly and with very little power. Uh, any questions on this? So you can sort cells at uh, at a thousand cells per second. Think about that. One thousand cells per second can be sorted in, in this manner. This field is called flow cytometry. Uh, one of the things that my lab is working on uh, over the last year is to do this type of sorting using imaging uh, rather than um, rather than these laser-based devices. So um, we take we use high-speed imaging. We take a picture, we process that picture really, really quickly and figure out the size and shape of the object, and then we make a sorting decision based on that. Um, if anyone's interested in reading more about this, uh, there's a, you can click on the links in the, in the slides, um, and this will pull up to paper. But you should be able to access this paper from on campus. All right. Another interesting thing you can do is um, electric fields can actually act as pumps uh, at the small scale. And there's a lot of different applications that are uh, emerging or have emerged over the last uh, five to ten years. So this is, a, um, Ben, like there's a lot of physics here that uh, I don't necessarily need you to understand 100% at this point. We're going to go to the details over it later. But just in general, I want you to get a general picture of it. So. This is a phenomenon called electro wetting, and what it is is just imagine that you have um, you have what's called a, a substrate here. This is electrically conductive, and the liquid you can see a little droplet up here that's labeled L. The liquid is also electrically conductive. All right, so liquid is conductive, and then you have this substrate is also conductive. In between them, you have an insulator labeled I. All right. So, what kind of electrical device is this? Two metal plates, two conductors. It's a capacitor. Again, the capacitor comes into play. But what's interesting is that the small scale electrostatics plays a very interesting role here because of electrostatic forces. So, you apply a voltage between uh, these two ends. So, um, the, the positive is being placed in the liquid. I'm sorry, in this case, the negative is being placed on the liquid and the positive is being placed on this, this um, the substrate. And so you get negative charge buildup in the liquid and positive charge buildup in the solid. And so it turns out what happens is that 
the fact that you have charges in the liquid, that these uh, charges are being pulled towards the insulator, there's an electrostatic force, right? These, um, these, negatively, um, this, these negative ions here are being attracted to the positive charges here. Remember this fundamental idea, like, uh, opposite charges attract to each other, right? So in this case, the, the, water, the ions that are in the water that are negatively charged are attracted to the positive charges in the substrate, and that actually pulls the water towards the substrate. So this droplet that was initially, um, you know, kind of like sitting like kind of like a, um, a drop, and this is the surface is hydrophobic, so the water doesn't like to flatten out on here. But when you apply this field, the, then the droplet flattens out like this, and it can do so very, very rapidly, as you can see in this video here. So you apply the voltage, and immediately the droplet flattens out, just within, uh, within a few milliseconds, maybe tens of milliseconds. All right, so just by applying an electric field, you can move objects, and this, this only works at the small scale. So what have researchers done with that? They've become very creative, and they said, well, we can not only move uh, droplets in the up and down direction, we actually can move them horizontally too. Um, so what they do is they have a grid of electrodes. If you can see here, there's, this is actually um, a grid of electrodes. Each of these small little squares you see here is a separate electrode. And by activating the different electrodes in different sequences, you can get the, uh, the droplets to move horizontally. So check out this video. We I don't know how long this video is. Work is making healthcare inaccessible. You know what? Let me let me make this a little bit larger. I'll, we'll just watch the entire video on uh, in here. So I do want you all to just get a sense for some of the interesting things the the electrostatics can do. Work is making healthcare inaccessible. In the United States, a blood test on average costs fifteen hundred dollars per test. A drug discovery company, on average, spends over a billion dollars in developing one single drug. A big chunk of this cost comes from specialty machines and the use of disposable such as pipette tips. So we have been developing a low-cost lab on a chip technology based on a physical principle called electrowetting, where we use electric fields to move, merge, stir, and analyze tiny biological samples. Basically using the principle I showed you earlier. So fundamentally, what we are doing in our chip is to charge and discharge tiny metal plates. The charging and discharging of these metal plates attracts and it repels tiny droplets. And by sequentially turning on and off these metal electrodes, you can gently shuttle a drop from one location to another. We develop a new surface coating that prevents droplets from leaving a trail behind and that's preventing contamination between droplets which could cross each other. Biologists in a lab, if a biologist... All right, so it gives you an idea of what, the, what they're doing here. So um, they can do some very sophisticated protocols with this, these, sort of, um, these sort of technologies. Um, I'll give you one, uh, one example here. This is actually from a lab that did a lot of the pioneering work. Um, ah, go. There we go. Um, so electrowetting wasn't, develop wasn't developed at the media lab. It was actually developed by, um, uh, by uh, um, Professor Kim and Fair, at, at, who's at UCLA and Duke. Um, they, they showed a lot of this technology and it's been picked up by a lot of other labs now. It's a lot of the pioneering work in, in the biotech field was done by Aaron Wheeler's lab in, at the University of Toronto. And he, he actually showed that you can mix and merge droplets like this, as you saw in the previous video. And you can do that with uh, biological samples like DNA and eventually with proteins. So you can see like a lot of the basic steps that you would do in a, in a biology lab, which is just like pipetting and mixing things together can be done uh, just using these electrostatic fields, which is kind of neat. 
Uh, one of the applications of this area, which has um, emerged recently in the consumer electronics field, is the um, was shown in IEEE Spectrum recently. Um, this is electrowedding based displays. I think you'll find some of this interesting. From the Samsung Research Center say they invented a new kind of color display. It could revolutionize e-readers, tablets, and cell phones. And if they're as good as they say it is, they just might be right. IEEE Spectrum is a great magazine, by the way. Could replace LCD displays <clears throat> in notebooks and tablets, such as the iPad, with lower power use and equal quality. It can also replace e-paper displays in readers, such as the Kindle. You know how that, so I was showing you little droplets moving around, right? By virtue of these electrostatic fields. Well, it turns out you can, if you have a, a lot of those droplets, a lot, each of those droplets acts as kind of like a pixel, then now you have a display technology, right? Certain pixels, if a drop is present, then, then it'll look a certain color. If a drop is not present, it'll look as a different color. So that's the idea behind these electro wedding based displays. An electro wedding display actually uses a voltage to move liquids around. Basically, said what we're doing actually by applying a voltage, we have a black liquid which we basically shift aside as a curtain. So basically, we open a black curtain, let the light go through, and if we want to make the pixel black, the curtain closes by taking the voltage off again. We split the pixel into an R, a red, a green, a blue, and sometimes a white pixel. And each of these will be this curtain. And each of these will be removed the right liquid. Well, every time I actually take one of our displays outside and put the sun on it, you think, wow, this is so much better than what is out there at the moment. For instance, if you take uh, a 9.7 inch iPad type of display, right? I mean, if you would swap an LCD for the electrolyte display, the fact that three uh, improvement of the performance would be probably about two times longer battery life. What we have done is actually taken this technology and put it into a, into an architecture, into a way which is resembling LCDs. And so we make use of, we've looked at, we know the LCD industry very well, we've looked at this and every time we have to make choices, we choose the ones which stay as close as possible to an LCD. Manufacturing wise, we use similar materials, we use the same driving ICs, same optical foils, except for of course the polarizers. So, yeah. all right. So this gives you gives you an idea of um, these these new types of displays are actually based on electro wedding uh, technologies. Um, it's called e ink now. You know. All right. Uh, any questions on um, on this? On okay. <laughs> well, feel free to ask at any point. <clears throat> uh, optical tweezers. So this is getting back into, um, these aren't electrostatic fields, these are getting back into the, we talked about the electromagnetic spectrum and different types of electromagnetic waves at different frequencies. Well, um, a small portion of that electromagnetic spectrum, as you know, is light. Um, and light, we usually think of light as being able to, um, you know, this allows us to see objects. Because light is reflecting off an object that's coming into our eyeball, and then our eyeball detects, detects it, converts it into a signal that our brain reads. But um, again, at the small scale, um, light actually light generates electrical and magnetic fields. Right? Uh, light can't move large objects unless you're in a Star Wars movie. But light can it can move small object because the forces the electromagnetic fields that the that a light generates those electromagnetic fields can actually be strong enough to move objects if they're very very tiny and so um the the nobel prize in physics in 2018 just last year well, or two years ago now um was uh, was won in part by uh, arthur ashkin who was uh, who in the 1980s became the first to demonstrate that you can use uh, laser light to grab objects, to push around objects. Um, he demonstrated this with particles and atoms and molecules and even living cells. It's quite amazing if you had if you had a cell culture. You know, you see these cell culture dishes where there's a bunch of cells everywhere. You can say, "Hey, I want to move that one over there with just with just light." So it's literally like um, a tractor beam. Um, Here's an example of what that looks like. 
So basically, like light is being used to move these particles one by one or in groups. So there's various types of um, you know, what they call optical tweezers. That's what these are called. Um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> And so, you know, you're actually moving multiple objects at once because this is a special type of optical tweezer where you're, um, where you're, uh, you're spreading out the light uh, across the area and you're creating certain light patterns on there. And by creating certain light patterns, you can do more complex manipulations. At the beginning, you saw that you were only moving one little particle, right? That's the basic optical tweezer, but this is showing you some very sophisticated, um, more sophisticated optical tweezers where you can move groups of objects at once in a very, uh, very interesting way. So the way that uh, the optical tweezers work, again, we're not gonna get into all the details of this, but you take a laser and you put it into a microscope objective so that laser light is focused into a really, really tiny spot. Have any of you guys, like, um, you know, when you were young, hopefully when you were young, not anymore, but like you take a, uh, you know, you take a, a, a magnifying glass and you can focus it down on the sidewalk and you can burn stuff. My brother and I used to burn uh, ants and stuff on the sidewalk. We were mean. So we, we don't do that anymore. Uh, but uh, it's focusing the light, right? The objective is focusing the light into a tiny spot, and it's focusing all that electromagnetic energy into a really small area. So um, what you're doing here is you take a laser beam, you focus all that electromagnetic energy down to a spot that's about a micron wide. And there's so much electromagnetic energy there not only is there energy, but there's gradients of energy. So gradient means that there's a very strong electromagnetic field here where the laser is focused right in the middle. And there's a weak, there's no electromagnetic energy out here. So there's a gradient being formed. It turns out that when you have a gradient in electric field, kind of like dielectrophoresis, the particles will move in the presence of this field gradient. So you can pull particles towards the laser. You can push them away depending on what the refractive index of the particle is. And this is a very, very powerful technique that's used throughout physics and biology nowadays for research. Um, it's only only 20 some years old, but it's become, become uh, pretty uh, ubiquitous. So uh, very, very cool stuff. Um, by the way, uh, this person in the middle here is another winner of the Nobel Prize. Um, have any of you heard, la heard of LASIK eye surgery? So the LASIK uses ultra-fast pulses of light to ablate material. It's actually ablating, like, like burning off pieces of your cornea when you do LASIK surgery. And so Gerard Maru, who, believe it or not, actually had him for a class. He used to teach at the University of Michigan. Um, he's now um, back in France or somewhere else. I'm not sure where, but um, he used to be a professor at the University of Michigan. Invented the center for um, a lot of the ultra-fast uh, optics, like being able to generate really high power but short time frame lasers, like picosecond, femtosecond lasers that generate high amounts of energy for short periods of time. This is where electromagnetic energy is not used to move objects. It's actually used to ablate objects, to like destroy objects, vaporize things. <laughs> Okay, and so um, his his work in um, in this area uh, resulted in um, LASIK surgery that we currently have, and a bunch of other things that that uh, that are probably not in the consumer domain really yet. So um, uh, there's another you know two two very famous people. I I I am afraid I don't remember who this uh, last, the third person is, but um, these two I'm aware of, that they were both in, in the field of using um, electromagnetic fields to do interesting stuff. <clears throat> All right, uh, questions? Okay. All right, there we go. All right, switching gears again. Here's another um, example of um, electromagnetics, which is very relevant to the automotive industry. Um, electromagnetics and power generation. Actually, not just automotive, but um, I'm sorry. The next one is yeah. powertrains is related to automotive. This is related to power generation. Sorry, I misread the slide. But um, anyways, I think I, some of you mentioned that you work at, at DTE. 
uh, in the first class. Um, electromagnetics plays a very important role in, in generating power through, uh, through wind and hydro. So um, uh, in this area where we have like the, uh, we have like many hydro sources, um, including like, you know, uh, uh, long flow, flows of water, like the, you know, parts of the Detroit River, but also the place like Niagara Falls where the water is coming from a higher, um, you know, a higher uh, uh, elevation. Um, places like uh, Hoover Dam, if anyone has been out near Vegas where they have Hoover Dam, it's quite amazing. Um, hundreds of hundreds of feet drop uh, just a very very sheer dam that's that, that was created through many many years of uh, very difficult work um, but uh, anyway get, getting back to the electromagnetics of it like these things basically allow like you know hydro allows water flow to go through a turbine that turbine rotates and that rotation creates uh, electromagnetic energy um, wind does something similar, uh, where you just have like a specially designed uh, blade that that moves when uh, you have even you know relatively small amounts of wind. Uh, but be because these blades are so large, they generate enough uh, uh, power for these blades to rotate. And uh, when they rotate, they generate um, they generate power. And I'm sure many of you have seen like these uh, wind farms either offshore or even if you just drive up into Ontario, you'll see tons of wind farms everywhere, right after you cross the border. So how do these things work? You're basically taking some a uh, rotating motion and that converting that rotating motion into uh, into power. Um, so. Uh, this is an example of a generator that's a steam uh, steam generator. This is where you're actually generating the motion of the turbine by using uh, by using steam. So in this case, you're um, boiling water, and that steam goes into the turbine, and that turbine rotates. So that's the third way of rotating a turbine. The first one was hydro, where you're just flowing water down from a dam uh, from high to low elevation. The second one was wind, and the third one is a steam turbine. The, the, the steam turbine, of course, you need to put a lot of energy in in order to get the turbine to rotate. So it's not, it's not quite a power generation source per se. Uh, but when, when, this, uh, when the turbine rotates, there's something called Faraday's law. The Faraday's law of induction, which is the third Maxwell equation that we're going to be talking about. And that's the basis for a lot of the electrical power generators that are on the market today. So um, uh, things like coal, hydro, nuclear, nuclear, geothermal, and wind. So a coal type plant would actually, you'd have a fuel source like coal here that that um, uh, that creates the steam. You could have a nuclear source that creates the steam also, but eventually these turbines are spinning and by Faraday's law, you create um, uh, electromagnetic power. So what is Faraday's law? Uh, Faraday's law basically says that when you have, um, if you have a coil, if you have a coil that is moving uh, a, you know, kind of like a loop. If you have that coil that is moving in the presence of uh, a magnetic field, then there will be a, uh, a current and a voltage induced in that coil of wire. So basically you have like these water coils that are in, that are attached to the turbine. So these coils are rotating uh, within, within the generator that you see here. And the generator has a permanent magnets in there too to, to have a permanent magnetic field. And then these things are these coils are moving in the presence of that magnetic field and that generates a current. And that was described by Michael Faraday, a very famous law that's used throughout electromagnetic power generation uh, uh, nowadays. Uh, solar power, electromagnetics obviously plays a role in solar power generation as well. If you're interested in, in uh, photovoltaics, um, ECE 4570, which is about solid state devices, I also teach that class. Um, and there's, there's also a graduate level course 5550 where we go in depth into um, semiconductor devices uh, and some of which are used in solar power generation. Uh, but I'll just mention briefly here that electromagnetics plays, it's a, it plays an important role because when we study these electronic devices we have like positive charges, we have these things called holes, and then we have electrons which have negative charge. Electromagnetics governs how these positive and negative charges move through um, semiconductor devices. They govern how semiconductor devices operate. So 
it, it's it's um, in in solar power, for example. You know, you have light electromagnetic radiation that comes in. It creates an electron hole pair, and the electric fields generated in the junction pull those two apart, and um, that's what ultimately generates an electrical current. I don't expect you to understand that that two second description that I gave right now, but um, just gives you an idea of where the uh, electromagnetics plays a role. And if many of you know, like on a, on a sunny day, like the sun provides about a thousand watts per uh, per square meter. So uh, it's, it's a very uh, abundant form of energy that we have. Um, and we are now in many parts of the world are moving towards using more and more solar, um, to, you know, for uh, uh, renewable power generation. So once we generate the power, we talked about turbines and photovoltaics. Now, how do we deliver that power? Electromagnetics plays a very important role in power delivery um, because of what's a stuff called transmission line theory. Um, the first electromagnetic power generation and delivery system was, was DC, meaning it delivered DC power. Um, the voltages and currents were not varying in time. But um, eventually it was found out that that was less safe um, and it was also less efficient. So eventually, the DC power was uh, moved over to AC power. As many of you know, when you plug something in the wall outlet, the wall outlet, does anyone know what kind of voltage is coming out of your wall outlet? 120 volts. And do you know the frequency? 60 hertz. That's right. So it turns out that delivering power at AC power is more efficient than sending DC power. That's why you don't see like 12 volt power coming in from your power um, from your electrical utility company usually have these wall transformers. You plug the wall transformer in and that creates the DC power that you use to charge your iPhones. Um, when, when you send AC power over really, really long distances, you have to use transmission line theory to design these power distribution systems. Um, why? Because, uh, you know, wh when we design electrical circuits, we assume that the voltage, let's say you have a voltage source here and it's an AC source, Whatever voltage source is in this node, when you do basic circuit analysis, you assume that whatever voltage is here is the same as the voltage further down in the line. So let's say you have a wire. You assume at one end of the wire that the voltage is the same on the left side as, as it is on the right side. Okay, That's true if the wire is small compared to the wavelength. It's not true if the wire is very long compared to the wavelength. So. Um, you know, if you calculate like a 60 hertz wave, um, you know, we, we, can, we can do the math real quick. Um, 60 hertz wave, what is the wavelength of that <coughs> electromagnetic wave? We can um, just do a quick calculation here. Um, this is similar to the calculation that we did earlier. So uh, let's make this larger. So the dispersion equation, the speed of light is equal to lambda times the frequency. All right, so this is 3 times 10 to the 8th. Someone with a calculator could help me. I appreciate it. Um, lambda times um, 60, 60 hertz. So what is uh, what does a wavelength come out to? So the lambda is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8th over 60? Yeah. Okay, so what is that? 5 million, okay. Meters. Okay, so that's a, that's a really, really long wavelength, right? So if... So uh, uh, if your electrical distribution lines happen to span a really, really long distance, that assumption of the assumption of the the um, the length of the electrical line being being much smaller than the wavelength may not hold true. 
And so as a result of that, um, you have to use some transmission line theory uh, to design your electrical networks um, to avoid things like reflection. This is also used in wireless communication design. If you're, if you're designing really high frequency stuff that have small wavelengths that are on the order of centimeters, your electrical circuits actually need to be designed using uh, transmission line theory as well. So um, some aspects of transmission line theory we will cover in the second part of the course when we get to some of the time-varying uh, uh, time varying fields. Um, something about electromagnetic radiation that you may not know, I just, uh, I, I saw this picture once, I thought it'd be cool to share with the class. Um, the power lines, if you've ever stood under one of these massive power distribution lines, um, you know, don't assume that there's not massive amounts of voltage going through you. Because, uh, uh, you know, this artist did this experiment once where he just basically took fluorescent bulbs and just put them right on the ground. They're not connected to any electrical line, but they're placed right under, uh, um, one of these power sources, massive, we're sending like kilovolts of um, voltage through these lines. Um, I, I mentioned that, you, we, we just mentioned that the, um, the power that you get in your electrical outlet is 120 volts, right? <laughs> but, the, but the voltages that's sent by the power utility company that's coming in from the power sources are on the order of kilovolts. They send them in at higher voltages because it's more efficient to do it that way. When you have high voltages, um, just because the voltage, just because that power line happens to have an insulator around it, that doesn't mean that the field lines stop at the at the insulator. The field lines actually extend outwards from the insulator, and so you can actually have like very strong electric fields um, that are even like you know tens of meters away from the power lines. So it's just something that you all might want to be aware of. Uh, moving on, um, also in the area of energy, um, electros electromagnetics, electrostatics plays an important role in, in some of the uh, energy storage devices that are being used nowadays. Uh, for example, um, you know, batteries is one aspect uh, which is largely based on electrochemistry. Uh, supercapacitors are um, a more standard type of elect uh, electrical device that has certain applications where you need very high power density. So batteries are suitable for, um, for cars because they have uh, large energy density, but the power density, which means how much energy that the thing can generate instantaneously, um, uh, supercapacitors do much better with that. So, um, you know, supercapacitors are basically certain types of capacitors that have a very large uh, surface area, um, larger surface area, generates more capacitance. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, you saw that equation, capacitance is equal to epsilon A over D. So the A part of it, the more effective surface area a capacitor has, um, the more capacitance it will have. And the more capacitance it has, we are going to find out later in this class that larger capacitance means more energy storage. A capacitor actually stores electrical energy in the form of charge. All right, more stuff. Um, electromagnetics in, in electronics design. Um, how many of you have designed a printed circuit board before? How many of you have seen a printed circuit board before? Okay, I hope all of you. You should all be raising your hands. <laughs> um, you know, printed, uh, if, if you haven't seen one yet, uh, throw your iPhone on the ground and then break it open and look inside of it. It's all, it's a, a big printed circuit board. Um, inside it. Actually, I didn't tell you to do that. I don't want you to come come at me and say, hey, you don't. <laughs> anyway, um, so this is an example of what a circuit board looks like. You know, you'll see that um, uh, they have a lot of these copper traces on there, and there's a lot of like tiny electrical components soldered to the circuit board, okay? So electromagnetics plays an important role in modern circuit boards that operate at high frequencies. Um, I showed you an example before Okay, um, I showed you an example before of uh, printed circuit boards that actually have antennas built into it. So this is this is a Bluetooth antenna here, and the rest of the circuit board you can see here has some places for components to be soldered on and so forth. Um, so it turns out that when you're doing very high speed design, 
uh, by high speed ex design, some examples of where, um, does anyone know examples of like high speed electronics, um, printed circuit boards that are used in either the automotive or consumer electronics? So we iPhone, the iPhone and the Android, you know, the high end phones, you know, the antenna portion of it is operating at high frequency. Sure, that's one example. But um, uh, other examples that you might be aware of. Take, just take a guess. Think about applications, electronics, where you need really, really fast data rates and high performance computing. Sensors. Sensors is one of them, yep. What else? How about high performance graphics? Yeah. I was about to say. You were going to say, okay, yeah. good. Yeah, so for those of you who played like, um, like uh, uh, Xbox 360 or uh, what's the, um, what's the latest and greatest gaming system now? PS4. PS4? Yeah. If you actually open up... Uh, it's like six years old. PS4 is six years old? Than that, yeah. But oh. Still what's the latest then? It's going to be coming out with them soon. There's PS5? PS5. 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 <laughs> Well, if, if you look inside one of those things, they're, they transmit very high speed. Um, uh, if you look at the motherboard for one of those things, there's really a lot of high speed transmission of graphical information uh, within those boards. And so they have to be designed very, very carefully um, when the boards are operating at gigahertz speeds. Nowadays, these you know, computational devices are operating at gigahertz speeds. And um, if you, again, if you do the math with gigahertz, like, you know, we, we did this. Uh, we did this calculation here. If you're operating at, let's do C equals lambda times F. And now um, 3 times 10 to the 8th equals lambda times, um, uh, let's say, 3 times 10 to the 9th. So this is, this is 3 gigahertz, right? If you have an electrical signal, Traveling down, um, tra traveling down a wire, and that the frequency of that signal is three gigahertz, then the wavelength ends up being, um, let's see, three to three times ten to the eighth, is one tenth meters. So roughly uh, ten centimeters. Okay. So the wavelength of your signal is actually comparable to the length of your copper, it can become com comparable to the length of the copper traces. Because you know, you imagine like a, a printed circuit board that's about this big, right? You might have some copper traces running through there that's routing your signals. So when this happens, you can get um, uh, differing levels of voltage along different portions of your copper trace. Secondly, secondly you can also get interference between two lines. So, uh, for example, like let's say you have two copper traces right next to each other, right? Okay, um, I'm going to mention again, what electronic device might this look like? You have two metal things and then you have air in between them. What? It's a capacitor, right? Well, capacitance is epsilon A over D, we know that. And the electronic impedance, is that, what's the electronic impedance of a capacitor? <laughs> 1 over J -C. 1 over J omega C, right? So the impedance, the, the omega, well, let's write this down. The impedance of a capacitor is 1 over J omega C. So when omega gets large, when you have large frequencies, what happens to the impedance? It goes down, right? Capacitor, it looks like a short circuit at high frequencies. So what does that mean? That means at high frequencies, an electromagnetic signal could actually have zero or, or very low impedance to go into the line right next to it. You see? So this is this is called electromagnetic coupling. And you can look at it from the circuit designer perspective. You can also look at it from the electromagnetics person uh, per perspective, where you know electromagnetics engineers or EMC engineers, electromagnetic compatibility, electromagnetic interference, <laughs> EMI. These engineers work on simulations of devices where you look at the electric fields and these types of things and you look at how much coupling do you actually get between the traces um, on a circuit board or the wires in a car. We talked about um, you know, uh, various types of interference that can happen in an automobile, for example. Like if you have two wires that are not properly grounded that are next to each other, you can have coupling between the wires 
um, which can result in all sorts of things going haywire in a, in a, in a car or other type systems. So um, these are field simulations. We're actually going to be doing some field simulations um, in this class um, where we use a software called Compsol. And you can look at what, where the electrical and magnetic fields that are being generated from a certain source and um, uh, uh, how, how this coupling effect can actually happen. You can actually see, for example, in a field simulation here, um, these are uh, voltage, um, uh, voltage contours. So every line that you see here is progressively lower voltage. So you can see here that there's a very high voltage on, on this one, but there's, there's some of that voltage is actually coupling over into the, the wire right next to it. So it turns out when you do high-speed printed circuit board design, you actually have to design the traces in a way such that this coupling doesn't affect, this coupling effect doesn't happen. For example, the, the, the ground has to be directly, always has to be directly underneath the high-speed trace. In some cases, you may need to have guard lines around it, meaning like traces of copper that are also grounded that are on the left and right side of it. So this kind of shields, um, it shields the electromagnetic radi radiation from splaying out into adjacent uh, wires. So uh, this has become an important area of uh, electronics design just because of um, that everything is high speed nowadays. Not just high speed um, in the computation side where processors are operating at three or four gigahertz or so, but also in the wireless communication side <laughs> because the antennas that we design into our printed circuit boards, those are also operating at you know, like um, a two, two gigahertz or so, that's the typical frequencies for Bluetooth. And then several hundreds of megahertz uh, is the frequencies that are typically used for cell phone communications. Uh, 2.4 gigahertz also used for Wi-Fi. Questions? Automotive EMC is becoming a pretty important field right now because all cars are, um, you know, very much electronically controlled nowadays. Uh, the final thing I'll talk about here is um, electromagnetics in um, automotive powertrains. Um, I have a picture of the Volt here. This is from a class like three years ago. I think we should all agree that <laughs> we should probably put a picture of the Tesla on here instead okay. right now. The Volt, unfortunately, is no longer being made. It was a really, really cool car. I, um, uh, now Chevy's moved on from the Volt, to, which, is, which was essentially a hybrid vehicle, to the Bolt, which is with a B. And the Bolt is um, a purely electric, uh, purely electric vehicle. Also, a really nice piece of technology. But um, Teslas have done; they've um, been like a, an, a real innovator in the field of electric cars um, in the last uh, in the last ten years or so. Some of you have seen like their their truck, the Cybertruck, then like the truck that they use for um, automotive or for um, that can replace the big Mack trucks that you see, and then the Tesla Model S, Model Three, and all that stuff. Really, really cool uh, stuff that's happening. Um, interestingly, Tesla doesn't get the credit for making the first electric car, first mass market electric car. And uh, this, the Chevy Volt actually wasn't the first mass market electric car either. Do any of you remember what the first mass market electric car was? No, nope. not even Toyota Leaf, even before that. It was made by GM. It was made by GM, yeah. Does anyone know what it was called? No, I don't even remember what the name was. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember now. It was it was called the EV1. Is that does that ring a bell for anyone? It was actually in the mid '90s where it came out. Um, it was a car that was well beyond its time, way beyond its time. Uh, amazing technology. Um, it was uh, they didn't have lithium ion battery technology at the time. They had it was running on nickel. I'm sorry, lead acid batteries, lead, no, not lead acid. It was running on, I think, maybe a nickel-based battery chemistry, which had a lower, um, lower energy density. And uh, that's one of the reasons why that electric car was um, never made it really, really big. Um, it was sold on a lease basis. You could only lease it because these batteries had a limited lifetime. They didn't wanna, want uh, owners to be stuck with like a very expensive car that's battery just didn't work anymore. Um, and there were other political reasons why GM killed that electric car. And it, that's outlined in this book, why GM killed the electric car. There's a, a very famous book about that. If you're interested, uh, you can read about that. But that and GM actually started the electric car uh, industry like decades ago, but it just wasn't ready for prime time. Um, I, 
actually, like I was an intern out at GM in 1997. And um, on the last day, they took all the interns out to the, uh, uh, out in, where is it? In Milford, the Milford Proving Grounds. And, um, you know, all I remember all the interns had lined up to uh, drive the Corvette. And um, I ran over to the EV1 because I was so excited to try that. Um, and it turned out the electric vehicle, the EV1 had like pickup that was insane for the, a car of that size and such a tiny motor. It was almost as good as the Corvette. And um, and many of you see nowadays is that the Teslas that you see like on YouTube videos and things like that, they they routinely beat the Ferraris and the Lambos uh, easily. I mentioned this in class last time. Why is that? Well, because um, electric motors can generate a lot of torque when you're at low RPM. Whereas gas motors generate maximum torque when you're at high RPM. That's the reason why you'll see is that off the... You know, off the beat, the electric cars will totally kill these um, these like high powered gas uh, gas cars. But once you get to a certain speed, then um, you know, then those the, the gas powered cars will will have more power and they'll eventually would win a race in a long distance. In a short drag race, the electric cars will win. In a longer race, the the gas cars would probably um, would probably win. Um, so these are some of the interesting things that have happened. Uh, what's happened in the in, in the last ten years or so is that lithium ion battery technology has matured quite a bit uh, to the point where you can make these very large battery packs that have reasonable lifetime and they generate large amounts of power. And there's been a lot of work that goes into making them safe. Um, because of that battery technology, then. Um, you know, companies like Tesla, which Tesla initially was a really tiny company that, that just sold a Roadster. Um, eventually, Elon Musk bought that company and turned it into the behemoth that it is uh, today with all these different models. Um, some of the things that was really exciting about it that made people excited about the electric car industry, I mentioned the torque thing. Um, I also, uh, also that electric motors can be made um, uh, with fewer components and they're less complex than gas-powered uh, combustion-based um, motors because in combustion-based motors, you're literally blowing something up inside a chamber to generate some power, and then that power is captured into the cam. With uh, electromagnetic motors, you just have like you have magnets that are that are placed in a certain um, you know in a in a certain geometry, and then you're applying electric currents, and those electric currents uh, in uh, in conjunction with the magnetic field generate a force. So we'll be talking more about that in um, when we start getting into the electromagnetics portion of them. So these things can be made more compact and because of that you can put multiple motors in a thing. Instead of just having one motor that powers your whole vehicle, you could put a different motor in each wheel. And Tesla was really smart about that. They said, hey, you know, what could we do with that kind of stuff? Hey, we could offer, um, we could offer four-wheel drive. Not just like not just kind of the kind of four wheel drive where you have one motor and you have a special transmission that distributes that distributes the power to the four wheels like all wheel drive vehicles do, but literally where you have four different engines or um, on the on the different wheels. And this allows you to have much a much greater level of control. Another reason why some of these electric vehicles can really smoke things like in a, in a drag race. Um, uh, the, the Tesla P80 has like one engine in the front and a separate one in the back. So when it detects skidding in the bottom, in the rear tires, it'll actually decrease power to the rear tires uh, and vice versa. So it allows you to have a very more sophisticated level of control of the vehicle that gas powered engines can only do through transmissions. With electromagnetic, with, with electrical engines, you can directly control the engine uh, directly. Another thing that sort of came about is that the um, electromagnetic engines can be operated in reverse. So when you do braking, it actually um, sends power back. Um, and regenerative braking actually uh, helps charge the batteries when you brake the car. So in a conventional gas-powered vehicle with um, regular disc brakes, that energy that when you brake is converted to heat and it's lost forever. What's well, converted to heat? Um, whereas with regenerative braking, um, that power is actually going back and charging the charging the cars. So this was the technology behind uh, Toyota's um, the Toyota Prius. Regenerative braking helped um, hybrid cars get a big hold on the market because they you know they could actually harness that energy back that gave them much much better gas mileage. 
So a hybrid car, by the way, is where you actually have a gas motor and an electric motor. <coughs> I forgot to mention that. Um, what else can I say about um, uh, electromagnetic motors? Any questions about this stuff? Okay. So um, electromagnetics plays a, a very big role in these modern um, automotive powertrains. I mentioned a few classes ago, Ford is looking to hire almost exclusively electrical engineers, um, whereas in the past they only hired, uh, they were hired mostly mechanical. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to end with um, end with this. So this attempts, it's kind of a lame attempt really, to, to summarize some of the different areas that electrical engineers work on. And I say lame because there's so many different areas that electrical engineers work on nowadays. It's impossible to summarize it in one slide. It really is a pretty versatile career that we're going into. Um, so good choice on that. Um, I say that from a completely biased perspective. Um, but, you know, you can see where electromagnetics role, uh, plays a role in, um, you know, ultimately in the classes that you take or the things that you learn and ultimately in the careers or areas that you go into. Electromagnetic, it, it, it kind of forms the basis of everything. If, if you look at, you know, a lot of you may think that circuits is the most basic thing an electrical engineer can do. Electromagnetic sits at actually an even lower level than that, a more fundamental level, because electromagnetic goes into the device physics, the, the physics of a, what happens inside a resistor when charges go through there. You know, they're being propelled by an electric field, and that's what's causing them to move through there. They're bumping into things. That creates resistance. Um, these things play into different basic circuit, circuit components, like the resistors, capacitors. We talked a lot about capacitors today. And transistors, there's electromagnetic field uh, the basis of transistors, um, and these go into all the digital and analog circuits that you develop. Um, transistors we talk about in my solid state device class, and um, the interesting thing about those is those that is the transistor is the most manufactured component of humankind. Period. We have made trillions of uh, more than one trillion transistors since they were invented in the fifties. Trillion. <laughs> no, 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 no. More than that. More than that. No, no, several orders of magnitude more. Than that. Um, each computer chip contains a, a billion <laughs> transistors. So, you know, you 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 can um, you can look it up on Google. See how many like it's an insane number of transistors that have been made since their inception in the fifties. Um, so this all goes in digital analog circuit design. So many of you will go into um, designing computers, designing electronics. Um, this is a lot of the bread and butter work that the electrical engineers do. Um, electromagnetics also plays a very important role in optics. Optics is a field of how light is generated, how light propagates. And uh, one of the most important roles of optics, as I mentioned to you, is in telecommunications. Fiber optic communications have a basis in optics. And optics also plays a very important role in medical imaging. Imaging is a big deal. Not, not just medical imaging, but like things like LIDAR nowadays. LIDAR and radar and some of the things that are used in automotive driving assist. So electromagnetics forms a basis of electromagnetic waves, how they, uh, how they propagate, and so forth. Um, electromagnetic wave propagation also plays an important role in telecommunications um, by, through wireless, through satellite links, through cell phone communications. It's all about electro, electromagnetic wave propagation. Um, electromagnetic wave propagation plays a role in power engineering when you look at transmission line theory and how you send these high power waves through our transmission lines. And then over on the left here uh, is um, electromagnetics. We're going to talk a lot about the focus of this class is really going to be a lot about electromagnetics fields and forces. Um, and nowadays, as I mentioned, these electrostatic forces are used ubiquitously in things like accelerometers, uh, gyroscopes, which is you know, accel accelerometers detect motion, gyros detect rotation. Um, and uh, these types of sensors are very, very widely used um, nowadays in, in ev pretty much every, every major device you can think of. So, um, yeah, so the importance of this class, as I mentioned, is like forming the foundation. And uh, when we start getting into the vector math stuff starting next week, it's going to become maybe a lot more dry. It's going to be a lot of math, a lot of calculus, reviewing that stuff. So I just want you to remember, keep your mind on Keep your eye on the prize is that the stuff you're learning 
here actually plays into all the all the areas of electrical engineering that you're going to be using in your career and uh, learning fundamental stuff is really tough once you're out working you know when you're out working a job you're gonna have a boss that's telling you okay we need this thing done by this date this thing done by this date it you won't have as much time to learn really fundamental stuff so the university when you're here you're you know you're spending like you know, most of your energies on this, um, that's the time to really learn a lot of these fundamentals that you can, uh, it'll, um, you know, pay its dividends in your, um, in your future career. Uh, so to summarize, um, to electromagnetics is very fundamental to the areas of electrical engineering in our world. Um, a lot of these areas are becoming very important nowadays. Energy sustainability, wireless communications, obviously, portable electronics and sensors, uh, uh, Internet of Things devices, they're all very become important in the modern world. So uh, just, uh, you know, we've, we've spent this module kind of like taking an interesting look at uh, a bunch of the areas where electromagnetics plays an important role. So just to get you interested and also to give you a sense of, you know, what the electrical engineering field is looking like right now. Um, I, this is generally not part of a typical syllabus. The reason I do this is because I want to kind of get this point where I want you all to appreciate the fact that the the field is rapidly changing. Knowing about these areas is, is great, so that it gives you enthusiasm about the field, but you have to continue learning about these areas as you go on in your careers. It's not enough to just learn and regurgitate material on an exam. It's important for you to actually kind of have this vision of like this overview of what what's going on in your in your field, not just in the particular area that you work in, what your boss is telling you to do, but just in general. So like things like reading like IEEE Spectrum, uh, which talks about all areas of electrical engineering, everything from signal processing to sensors to circuit design to wireless and everything, um, getting you know, maybe you consider like, you know, have, have a subscription to that magazine or just read it once in a while or just read other types of, you know, there's things like EE Times, um, there's technology review, there's all sorts of online sites that you can go to every day to see what's happening um, in the electrical engineering field. And that's what I basically do to just kind of assemble some of the stuff that you saw here. I want you to appreciate the idea of um, this idea of lifelong learning. You, 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 you just constantly like try to learn new stuff and see what what's new and exciting in the field, and then you tr try to apply it to what, you're, what you happen to be doing at your job. The best engineers are the ones who take a lot of these ideas and, and push their own field forward uh, with this, um, you know, with the knowledge. So this course is just gonna give you some basics. Um, I do want you to just work hard in this class and learn the fundamentals and it'll play an important role in just um, all the other things that you work on um, as an electrical engineer. Why won't this, why won't this save? Okay, so uh, we're going to end there with this with this lecture, and I'm just going to stop. Um